actually, I collect them. Uh, I, I, I um, sense the success of Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I've, uh, you know, done so many interviews. And what I like mostly about the horror magazines, more than, than the articles, is I'm very fond of uh, illustration. Mm -hmm. I love the, uh, the illustration, the young illustrators that work. So I collect them for that. Um, like, like the Dylan Dog in Milan and other ones like that. Oh, we send you several copies. If you oh, all right, thanks. There's another magazine specialized in gore. It's called Toxic. Ah, yes, I've, I have some issues of Toxic. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we'll send you this one. Uh, so, is there going to be a Freddy Seven? I don't know. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just finished Freddy Six, and uh, they call it the name of it is Freddy's Dead. If you, I don't know if you've heard that or not. So. It's in its the script and the story is such that uh, I'm under the impression that this is the last one. This is the ultimate nightmare, uh, the huge finale in it. You see Freddy as a child and Freddy as a teenager, and Freddy before he's burned. I played Freddy before he's burned, and and uh, what made Freddy this vicious man? And then the finale is all in 3D. We shot it in 3D. Mm -hmm. It's new, the new technology for 3D. And uh, so I'm, I'm anticipating this is the last, the last nightmare movie. It was a, a big budget, and uh, the 3D is very costly. We just finished it about three or four weeks ago. I mean, I finished. The movie is still uh, in post-production because the, uh, the 3D effects and the opticals will take them a while. Uh, probably, probably be released in America in October. Your enemies are not uh, teenagers in this one, or are they? Well, they're young adults. Um, Freddy's, uh, he, he leaves the boundaries of Springwood, this sort of generic uh, bourgeois town, you know, middle class kind of place, suburb that he's been haunting. And he's now in this sort of dark, violent, urban uh, area uh, where the runaway, uh, it's like a shelter for, for, for teenage runaways. Okay. Uh, Yafet Kato uh, plays one of the people that runs the shelter. Oh, Yafet yeah. Kato from Aliens, yes. There's Rosanne Barr in it, right? Pardon? Rosanne Rose Barr. Rosanne Barr uh, does a cameo in it, and Johnny Depp. Uh, at one point, Willem Dafoe was going to, but uh, I don't think his agent was too happy about what he did in, um, in Wild at Heart, so, yeah. so he was unable to, to do a, a cameo. But. Uh, Leslie Dean, who is my star in 976 Evil, she's one of the stars also, and uh, she's very, very good. Well, let's talk about 976 Evil. What, what does it mean for you? Well, I mean, it was, first of all, I was very happy to be asked to make my debut uh, with a feature film instead of television. I had been asked to direct an episode of V, but the series went off the air before I was able to. And also on my last series, Downtown, uh, I had been asked to direct uh, Michael Norrie. Um, but this was an opportunity for me to do a feature, and the experience was, was, was very good and very educational. And I, I was proud of what I turned in uh, in my first screening. But when I went to work for Rennie Harlan in part four, because the company that that hired me was had only never never released horror movies before, only action films. In, the, in, in America, there's a sort of a rule that action films have to be only 90 minutes long. So they kept cutting away at my movie to make it shorter. I turned in maybe a 107 minute, 110 minute film. And I could have brought it down to perhaps 100 and 105 minutes, but it, had they asked me, but I had to go to work on on part four. And the, the editor that they brought to make it shorter, he just sort of went and just cut uh, arbitrarily the heads and tails, the beginning and ends off of scenes to make it shorter. And so it's, it's a little jumpy now. It doesn't have the blend uh, and the segue uh, that I had constructed uh, uh, from sequence to sequence that I wanted. And you know, when, when I see it now, I see that and, it, and it's, it's a little disturbing. Although I'm 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 proud of it as a as a as a first effort, and I'm, I I think my cast is good, uh, especially you know Stephen Jeffries. Yeah. yeah. Well, you never asked to direct 
one of the three movies? Yes, I was asked to direct part three, but I think what they forgot is there's not enough hours in the day yeah. to put that makeup on, to direct, to take that makeup off, to go see rushes. There's just not enough hours in the day. I would never, when do I sleep? <laughs> when do I eat? Um, it would have, it's virtually impossible. It's, it's hard enough to direct without acting and directing and to act and direct and also to try to wear that makeup and, and take the time. To, back then, I, the makeup took three and a half hours to put on and uh, I just, there was just simply not enough time. So I, I, was, I said, no, I can't do it. And uh, in the Freddy movies, there's uh, like a, a parallel with, uh, I thought about that this morning, with the Frankenstein theory. Oh yeah. It was the Revenge of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, where is the bride of Freddy? I don't know. You actually, in, in, in part six, you, you, you get to meet uh, Loretta Kruger, who's a sort of abused, long-suffering wife of, of Freddy before, he, uh, before the, the neighbors burn him <laughs> alive. And uh, they have a good, they have nice actress in that. I get to, I actually kill her and my daughter, my little daughter. Gets to, she witnesses me killing mommy. It's a very horrific scene. Kind of like the, the horrific scenes in Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. It's a very, very rough scene. It's hard to do. What, what will happen if the, the producers decide to, uh, to go on with the series without you? Oh, well, if they do a part seven, I will do it. They have me under contract in case there is. But I think they think part six is, is, is the end of the series, at least uh, as I understand it, they, they, they do. Well, would you know what? Did they end the series because of why they end the series? Well, I, I think they just think it's probably run its course. And they fear, with all the time and effort we put into part six, that, that this is the one we won't be able to top, you know. Um, part one is probably the most scary. Part two, we made some mistakes, but it's, it's got some great lines and great effects and sequences in it and very Freudian and sexual. Part three is just is, is a wonderful ensemble piece and very successful. Part four, Rennie Harlan's version, is sort of like the MTV Freddy. And then part five is considered now sort of the artistic film of the ones. And now part six is like the finale. It's like the it's sort of the bookend um, with the 3D finale to it and the backstory of Freddy. Rachel Talalay, who produced parts two, three, and four as the director, and her husband uh, produced part five. And Rachel also produced Hairspray and uh, Cry Baby uh, for John Waters. So she brings a really unique kind of perspective to the movie. Um, that, that I think the audiences will like, but but I just have a feeling this may be the last one. I don't know how we could possibly top this one. I know I've said that before, but I mean I, I, I try to think what what else we could do to give the fans their money's worth and not just make one for the sake of making one. The one thing I respect about New Line is that they have always put more money of theirs up on the screen for the audience and given the audience more effects. And, and, and on part five that was screened last night, for instance, uh, one of the effects guys, Alan Monroe, was, he's an Oscar for Beetlejuice. I mean, yeah. this is the quality kind of people that they hire, you know, the very best young, hip uh, people working in effects, make, makeup effects and special effects. Yeah, the, what, what's missing? You told on stage last night that uh, there were special effects missing oh, yeah. in the motorbike. Uh, in the motorcycle sequence, that sequence, I saw that sequence in black and white only, uncut. And um, it just takes longer. Uh, it begins with like, almost like his mustache begins to grow. And they become electrical wires. And then he, he, he go, you know, and then his ribs break through and they become chrome pipes. And they go from they break out as as bones, and they grow down, and they go into the pipe. It just was longer. It built. It was just it built longer and longer and longer and longer. And his hands fused into the handlebars, and uh, it just took longer, and it was more detailed. And they they cut a lot of that out, and it gave us a next rating. And I think it's because in in America, Freddie was so popular, and they made toys. Uh, merchandise 
for Freddy, but they made it, instead of for teenagers, they made it for kids. And I think that uh, they got upset with New Line because they made Freddy stuff for, for young children, the toys and stuff, instead of making it for teenagers. And I think that they were punishing us, and that's why they gave us the, uh, the X. You know, but there are many, many, much more violent films than our film yeah. that year, and uh, I don't think it was fair, you know. And you talked yesterday also about uh, immortality, and uh, are you not afraid that uh, people will remember Freddy and not Robert Daniel? Oh, I'm sure uh, that when I die in my obituary, it'll say the man that played Freddy Krueger. I'm, I'm. I can live with that. I'm happy with that. Um, I have many years, and, and uh, I'm, I go right back. The reason I'm not able to stay for the entire festival is I have to go back and, mm -hmm. and shoot uh, a, a Wes Craven film. Uh, that he's, uh, write, he, he's writing a Philip Noyce, maybe directing the uh, director of Dead Calm. But, uh, and I'm no makeup and anything like that in that. Uh, so I haven't. I, very good career outside of Freddy. It's just, uh, I think when you do something as identifiable as that little puppy, it makes it easy for people to identify and pigeonhole you. So they'll, they'll probably say that, you know, forever. I, I've sort of made peace with that. Uh, but um, it's, you know, in terms of posterity, uh, it's kind of nice to know that uh, your work lives on in film, you know, that uh, forever. Do you think that you uh, it is important for you to feel that you you are uh, say a figure in a fantasy cinema like uh, Boris Karloff or Bela Lugosi? Well, I'm very honored to be mentioned uh, along with Boris Karloff and Lon Chaney or Vincent Price. Um, but you see, when I I had done so much, I, this is my 36th film, I think, uh, part six, and. Um, at any given night uh, in America, on cable television or on, in, in TV shows, and old TV shows, Robert England is in something else. I'm in an old Burt Reynolds movie or an old Charles Bronson movie or Barbara Streisand movie or something. I mean, I, and, and in reruns, so people know me uh, from other things. During the whole Freddy thing in America, I had two television series on the air and up until part four. Uh, v, the series V, and the series Downtown. So, so, and more people watch TV than, than go to movies. So people know my face and they know I'm another act. They see me do other parts all the time. So I don't worry uh, about just being uh, in the horror cinema. If Freddy would have happened in my career sooner, uh, then that would have probably been a problem. But be happening when it came in my career, there's, I, I don't have a problem with that. I was already very well established. Uh, as a character actor in Hollywood. Mm. With, uh, you saw, you talked about every prophet of a serial killer. Well, which movie, uh, Freddy or this one, is more has more influence on people? Do you think? Oh well, in 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 America, Henry, very small audience, very very small. Um, so, I mean, I I think it's a great film, uh, devastatingly. Uh, graphic docudrama, and, and I had to go drink good Belgian beer mm -hmm. after I saw it to kind of shake it off. But um, it is not a movie for everybody. I, would, I mean, I wouldn't want my mother to go see it. <laughs> but I think it is a, a great piece of art too. Um, but in America, it reached uh, its very, very, a very small audience only, and not not a big audience. However, in America right now, the number one movie in America is Silence of the Lambs. It's good. Too. Oh, great film. Have you seen it? Yeah, we saw yes, it this, this week. Great film. Anthony Hopkins, so good now. So, and here's a movie that is very, very frightening too, and, and graphic. And uh, it's the number one movie in America. You can't, it's just millions and millions and millions of dollars. You work with a, a lot of different uh, directors. You work with the Corman team on the Galaxy of Terror. Mm -hmm. well, well, you know who, very interesting, when I was working on Galaxy of Terror, across the hall from my dressing room was the art director. And he would be you know, doodling and throwing things away. And it was James Cameron oh, yeah. from Terminator. 
Yeah, I, used, I have some drawings of his from there. Uh, uh, which director is the one you you like more to work with? Well, if there is one. I've excuse me, oh, Chap Lang. Um, I mean, I I I've worked with uh, many directors that, that I like. I, I would, of course would love to direct or work with like Martin Scorsese or someone like that. Uh, but um, I don't know. You know, I I really like. I worked for Rennie Harlan twice now, and I really like Rennie a lot. Uh, we just get along very, very well. But even on my TV series, you know, I, I worked with, with some directors there that I liked, uh, various people. Um, sometimes it's just the personality that you like, and then other times it is their artistic nature. I would like, again, to work with Bob Rafelson. I worked with Bob Rafelson on Stay Hungry with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jeff Bridges and Sally Field. And I like Bob very much, and I liked his last movie, Mountains of the Moon. Uh, the African movie I thought was very, very interesting. The sense of humor of Freddy, is it yours or is it the screenwriter? Well, Wes Craven had some weird, cruel, jokey lines in part one, but not a lot, just very few. But he encouraged me to improvise the beginning and ends of scenes. And uh, because of this one or two cruel jokes, excuse me, yeah. That Freddie had in part one, ah, jet lagged, uh, because of these jokes, uh, you know, like if Freddie would put the face of the girl on and go, Tina, I sort of thought of this way, a uh, sort of attitude that Freddie had. And that's where uh, the Freddie sense of humor evolved from, the, from Wes Craven's writing and then me, you know, turning it into sort of these jokes of Freddie that Freddie would make, sort of like, Teasing teenagers about their own likes, you know, you know, teasing them about what they like or how they dress or the kind of shoes they wear, or something like that. I figured that would be the kind of cruel thing Freddie would do, kind of teasing them about their own problems back at them because Freddie can is like a mind reader. He's in your dreams. He knows your secrets, like he knows your diary, and he knows your flaws and your problems, and that's that's how he punishes you. Uh, and that's why Freddie would do a joke like in, uh, in part four when he, he does the cockroach joke, you know, because he's, the girl's afraid of cockroaches, so Freddie turns her into kind of a Kafka-esque cockroach. And that's sort of where we found that was uh, back in part one, you know. Uh, but the source of it's Wes Craven. And what, when we're talking about Craven, what do you think of Horace Pinker? Oh, you shocker, huh? Yeah. Well, I actually I met Mitch at a couple of parties. I like I like Mitch's work a lot, but uh, I I I I I think maybe Wes thought he was going to do another Nightmare on Elm Street, and maybe maybe he's a little disappointed in that. It's a good idea. There may I think there's going to be another shocker. Mm -hmm. So see, my favorite movie though, Wes's is I love Serpent and the Rainbow. Yeah. I think Serpent and the Rainbow is great. Well, can you tell us uh, something about uh, the phrase six? What's the story about? Well, basically, it's uh, uh, Freddy's leaves. Freddy needs to. It's a mystery. Uh, one of two characters is Freddy's child. When Freddy was sent to jail, they took his child away from him, and his child was adopted. And uh, so, throughout the movie, the mystery is which which character is his child and you don't you you are led you try to figure that out and uh one is a runaway uh boy and the other is the is a young lady that works at the shelter for the runaways and their lives are brought together by coinciding dreams that draw them back to springwood and they're not in, they're not from springwood they live out in there live in the city and they go to springwood and the mystery begins to unravel. Uh, you begin to learn which one of these people is, in fact, Freddy's child. And Freddy uses them being drawn to Springwood to haunt them. And when they leave and go back to the city, Freddy's in their mind now, and they bring Freddy with him. And so he's out, he lives again. He's now out of Springwood. And this sort of theme is that, that now Elm Street can be anywhere. And uh, he starts going after the various 
runaways in the in the homeless shelter um, that's run over by Yafe Kano. And in, by the finale, the child has figured a way to get into Freddy's brain himself. And so the finale is a sort of 3D tour of the memory of Freddy Krueger. You're actually in his brain in 3D, going through the sort of rooms of his brain. That should be good. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing stuff. It's really amazing stuff. And what you see, you see, you see some terrible things. You get to see, again, you see Freddy as a child and Freddy as an adolescent. And all these things. When are you going to direct again? Well, I may direct at the end of the year for um, uh, one of the producers of uh, Phantom of the Opera. I may go to Canada to direct uh, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. Uh, in fact, I have the script upstairs. Will you start it? No, I'll, I'll just direct. I might do a small part. A small part in it. Is there one of the Freddy's that you like? Uh, no, I don't mean you think it's better, but one that you well, like. Well, I think together. three and four together make a great double bill. You know, you went out and rent three and four on video and brought some pizza home, you know, mm -hmm. and watched them together. I think they go together very well. The way their cast overlaps, you know, the same cast. Uh, I think it's very good as a, as a sort of double bill. Maybe I think more festivals should probably, when they screen, maybe maybe screen three and four together because they go so well together. You said yesterday that you will miss uh, probably Miss Freddy after six months to start playing. Yeah. Will you be ready to produce it yourself if you have to? No, I, I would I would not be allowed to because I don't own the rights to the character. New Line Cinema bought the rights to the character from Wes Craven back on part one, so I I can talk about Freddy and I could put the glove on and I can do talk shows and and uh, personal appearances but I have to have their permission to put the makeup on. Mm. Uh, I don't really want to put the makeup on <laughs> but uh, they own the character. Yeah, Like they own those Ninja Turtles too, you know. <laughs> Very smart people. All right. Okay. I think we have everything we need. All right. Thank you very much.